Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, Canada's top soldier steps aside. Allegations of sexual misconduct against the chief of the defense staff just one month into the job. General McDonald was the person in charge of eradicating the very behavior he is accused of. And the government's vetting process called into question yet again. Vaccinations ramp up in hard-hit Quebec as some of the most vulnerable finally get their shot. We're very happy to, to, to get the vaccine. We see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> The growing concern over new variants found close to home. The B1526 is a variant that we are tracking. Where it comes from and why it's being looked for now. And on tonight's menu, gratitude. It's a hell of a way to fill up a Volvo. How one restaurant is reaching out to help. There's more good to come. This is The National. Canada's top military commander is being investigated tonight for an allegation of sexual misconduct in 2010. It is an allegation that evidently did not stop his appointment just last month. This is a big hit to the government because the previous top commander is still facing similar allegations. Sexual misconduct has plagued the Canadian forces. Ashley Burke has reaction to the latest revelations. I'm deeply sorry. I want you to know that I will do all that I can to support you, to stop these unacceptable acts from happening. Admiral Art McDonald started his term apologizing for racism and sexual misconduct in the forces. Now, a little over a month later, he faces allegations of his own. Demonstrating sovereignty in Canadian territory. That's McDonald in 2010, just before leaving for Canada's annual military exercise in the Arctic. CBC News has learned the sexual misconduct claim happened during this mission. McDonald, a Navy captain at the time, the incident allegedly involving a junior female subordinate at a party where alcohol was served. It is deeply troubling that the Canadian Chief of Defence Staff has had to step down only a month after assuming command. Former military member Stephanie Raymond, who was sexually assaulted by a superior, says this shows progress isn't being made six years into a mission to end sexual misconduct. I think the problem that still exists maybe is about the right that a female have to refuse or to say no to advance from higher ranks. Sources also say McDonald's case has been under investigation for a month. McDonald only learned that yesterday and the defense minister himself recently. That's what he told CBC's Vashi Capellos. When is recently? Well, unfortunately, Vashi, I can't answer those questions because of the ongoing investigations. I can assure you and all Canadians that I would never turn a blind eye to anything like this. But it comes on the heels of another investigation. McDonald's predecessor, General Jonathan Vance, accused of having inappropriate relationships with female subordinates. The leader of the NDP, Jagmeet Singh, criticized the government's vetting process, saying that there has been a pattern of poor choices from defense to the governor general that shows there's something clearly wrong with the process. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Our chief political correspondent, Rosie Barton, has more on this. So, Rosie, another chief of the defense staff leaves under a cloud. How bad is this for the liberals and for the defense minister? Well, Adrian, remember, this is a government that has labeled itself as a feminist government. Here we are now, as you say, with a second top leader of the armed forces accused of sexual misconduct. There's going to be some questions about uh, whether more needs to be done for better accountability inside the military, perhaps some civilian oversight. It's particularly difficult today for Minister Sajjan, who won't answer any specifics around what he knew, when he found out about the allegations. He says because of the ongoing investigation. But those are the details that people want in order to know that they can trust the government has done the right thing. And again, of course, it raises questions around vetting, an issue that, of course, came up previously with a former governor general. And I guess it also raises, you know, more damning questions about the culture in Canada's armed forces. Is this maybe a turning point? Yeah, you would think so, you would hope so, but the military has been at the cusp of a turning point many, many times before. There were a series of allegations around sexual misconduct in 2013. That led to an independent inquiry by a former Supreme Court justice that found that the military turned a blind eye to these incidents. 
The former chief of the defense staff, Jonathan Vance, launched Operation Honor to deal with this back in 2015, tried to update it just this past fall when critics said it had done very little to change the sexualized culture in the military. He now, as you say, also facing allegations of this nature. So there might be a window of opportunity here, but the government will have to put the right person in charge at a time when morale in the ranks will be low and trust, too, will be a serious concern. At issue, of course, Adrian will have a lot more to say on all this coming up. All right, Rosie, thanks for this. You bet. Now, we're watching some breaking news tonight. Joe Biden has made his first big military move, launching airstrikes against a target in Syria. The Pentagon is calling it retaliation for an attack on U.S. personnel in Iraq earlier this month. We're confident in, uh, in the target that we went after. We know what we hit. Uh, and, uh, and we're confident that that target was being used by the same uh, Shia militia that, uh, that conducted the, the strikes. Okay, so let's bring in Paul Hunter in Washington. Paul, can you put this in some context for us? Hey, Adrian. Look, this attack was approved by Joe Biden, full stop. That's a big deal unto itself. Ostensibly, it's retaliation for the rocket attack you mentioned, but it would certainly seem as if an underlying factor is that the U.S. wants to signal to Iran that if you somehow think Joe Biden is less likely to be aggressive than his predecessor when it comes to Iran, think again. Biden is one month into his presidency, and now here we are. It's described as a proportioned military response, a scaled strike, but it's an attack nonetheless. Okay, so I hear what you're saying about the messaging there, the intended messaging, but, but what kind of fallout could there be from this? Yeah, well, hard to say whether Iran will respond, uh, for example, but for Biden, this complicates things in other ways on a couple of fronts. He's made clear he wants to re-engage with Iran post-Trump and reopen that nuclear deal with Iran that was ended by Trump. A complicated and tenuous notion to begin with, this doesn't make that any easier. And as well, the Biden administration has meanwhile made clear it increasingly sees global challenges coming out of China as something that needs more attention than, say, the Middle East, more than it's been getting, and that Biden wants to aim American attention that way. This complicates that thinking as well, Adrian. All right, Paul, thank you. Okay, let's turn to COVID-19. Larger shipments of vaccines are arriving on Canadian soil and rollouts to the general public are already underway in some provinces with others planning to start soon. Now, Alberta is casting the widest net, vaccinating those 75 and up. But for other provinces, some tighter targets. In Ontario, it's only those 80 and up who can get their shots starting in mid-March. New Brunswick is eyeing those 85 and older. And in Manitoba, it's 95 and up. Now, Quebec has also opened up its rollout to the general population. Starting today, those 85 and up can get the shots. Allison Northcott takes us to a newly opened vaccine center where the overwhelming feeling was a sense of relief. As she got her first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, Giselle Fortiche was optimistic that the hardest moments of the pandemic may finally be behind her. I see the future in a better light, she says. She was hospitalized with COVID-19 and at 86 says she's lucky she survived. Thousands of Quebec seniors in the general population are now eligible to get vaccinated. People could book appointments as of 8 this morning and the health minister says nearly 100,000 signed up. At this vaccination center, there was hope for what it could one day bring. I'm missing my hugs. Nobody hugs me anymore. Okay, thank you very much. No problem, congrats. It's been great. Yeah, it's been long. Staff at this seniors wellness center spent the day helping people book appointments. Is that in the little shopping center? A lot of the 85 plus seniors are isolated uh, and they don't have access to the internet or a computer. He says it's a particular challenge for people with mobility or other health issues who can't get to a vaccination center. I have terminal cancer. Judith Coling says her doctors have told her to stay home, but she can only get her shot at a vaccination center. It's extremely impractical for someone like myself who is technically not allowed out of this house. With many seniors across the country eager for that first dose, some worry about those who could fall through the cracks. 
we need to roll it out in a way that it's accessible for older adults. It shouldn't be like trying to buy concert tickets or playoff tickets for a sports team. In Ontario, older seniors in the general population will have to wait until mid-March before they can book an appointment. We're very happy to, to get the vaccine. <laughs> but Monique Rémiard is glad the wait is over for her 93-year-old father. We see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> a moment of relief after a difficult year. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Laval, Quebec. And as provinces ramp up their rollouts, a reminder of where we are overall. About 1.7 million doses have been administered to Canadians, but the pace will need to pick up quite a bit. And the government says it will in order to meet its September target of giving the vaccine to every Canadian who wants one. Just about 50,000 shots were given today. In Ontario, more than 3,700 long-term care residents have died with COVID-19 since last spring. That's more than half of all COVID deaths in the province. Now an independent commission is looking for answers about how and why that happened. David Common with what it heard from the province's chief medical officer of health. To this day, COVID has killed more here than almost anywhere else in Canada, including Paul Parks. I'm so frustrated with our provincial government. His daughter Kathy believes it got so bad because the province failed. They won't even admit that they've done anything wrong. Most of the homes in Ontario have had an outbreak, many deadly. And the province's long-term care commission has spent months looking at what happened. Hearing this week from Ontario's chief medical officer, Dr. David Williams, who spoke repeatedly about staffing problems. He acknowledged a lack of infection prevention and control expertise as care home workers with key skills found better paying jobs were in the hospital. When fears rose, workers were inadvertently bringing the virus into homes from other jobs, Williams was reluctant to restrict them to just one workplace because, he said, care home positions didn't pay a large amount. So they were, I don't know, working in a kitchen making pizzas or something like that. Facing months of pressure to address the staffing crisis, Ontario's Premier yesterday announced free tuition for 6,000 people to become frontline personal support workers. But full-time work is still hard to come by, even now. And Doug Ford didn't create any jobs for those grads to go into, as both BC and Quebec did. And how did Quebec's homes perform in the second wave? Remarkably better than Ontario's, because in Ontario, we didn't do what the other provinces did. What is this government trying to hide? Meanwhile, Ontario's opposition is accusing the government of a cover-up. They point to thousands of largely redacted documents dumped by the government on the commission in the final stage of its hearings and add the panel asked for more time to find answers, but that request was rejected by government. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. Now, even today, more than 100 Ontario long-term care homes are in outbreak, but the province is looking for and finding some optimism. We're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm told that due to the vaccinations in our long-term care homes, more than 350 lives have already been saved. Officials say there has been a reduction in the daily death rates in long-term care homes and in the cases among residents and staff. And while transmission has decreased overall, here comes the caution. It is possible that could change fast. Modeling around the variants of concern suggest they might make up 40% of Ontario's COVID cases by the second week of March. That means hospitalizations are likely to go up too. And another variant has emerged, this one in New York City. Researchers say it has a mutation that appears to help the virus bypass elements of the immune system and potentially make vaccines less effective. Health reporter Vic Adopia now on what Canadian officials are watching for. The first day back after months of remote learning as New York sees new cases back to early December levels. I got the hand sanitizer in my bag and everything, so no one needs to worry about me. But researchers at Columbia University are worried about a new variant circulating here. It's called B1526. It has a mutation to the spike protein known as 484K, the same one found in variants first identified in South Africa and Brazil. And that could be a problem. People who are vaccinated with the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine, uh, they are, their ability to neutralize the virus 
the, the mutant virus is de decreased by many folds, and that's of significance. The research found the new variant went from being present in just a small number of New Yorkers in December to surging to about one in six cases this month, suggesting it could become the dominant variant in the city. The Columbia research is not yet published or peer-reviewed, but Canadian public health officials are taking note of B1526. That mutation seems to make the virus more transmissible and maybe more pathogenic in people that it infects. That's the bad news. So certainly it's uh, quite, as they say, on the radar to, 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 to date. And, uh, as far as I know, we haven't detected that specific variant. Still, a network of Canadian labs is monitoring for several other new variants like the one found in New York. The B1526 is a variant that we are tracking in Canada, but is not considered a variant of concern yet. Uh, it is definitely under study. Yet given the amount of travel and trade that continues between Canada and the U.S., public health officials stress the need to continue with infection prevention measures. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. In Alberta today, plans for a balanced budget are out the window. The government has released its first pandemic budget, no new taxes and a deficit that's more than doubled since last year. Rafi Bujikanian has the details and the impact. It's a budget that is focused on what matters most today, on health care and jobs. Alberta's fiscal reckoning this was not. $1.25 billion in new money on health care to fight COVID-19, infrastructure spending to create thousands of construction jobs, and that political taboo, a sales tax, not a hint. Right now, uh, we really believe that we need to focus on the job at hand, the job at hand is, is resourcing health care adequately. This after months of battles with doctors saying they get paid too much and want too many public health restrictions to fend off COVID-19. Political observers have other questions about Premier Jason uh, Kenney's revenue. recent moves. He invested in um, the, the Alberta portion of the Keystone XL pipeline knowing that it was possible that an environmentalist uh, who imposed this this pipeline was uh, w w had a chance of, of winning the presidency. A gamble Alberta's new fiscal plan reveals will cost people here at least $1.2 billion now that President Joe Biden has revoked permits. And there are some cuts going ahead. The equivalent of 750 full-time jobs in post-secondary education, leaving uncertainty behind for those who still have work. And I have... Uh you know, kids that I'm supporting and, you know, like, like anyone who's working, you know, I, I have uh, a life that I want to, to maintain. There's definitely a lot of people in my position who are brushing up their, their resume. This government's been in a tough spot for months. Jason Kenney, one of the few political leaders in Canada to drastically lose popularity during the pandemic. Today's budget hopes to start winning back the confidence of the Albertans he's lost. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. A plea deal offered to an Ottawa police officer has some of his victims speaking out. They're angry that even though he was charged with more than 30 offenses, including sexual assault, he admitted to only a handful of charges. The Fifth Estate's Judy Trin spoke with two of his victims. I was disappointed and heartbroken. You say heartbroken, why? I trusted in our system. Um, I was hoping for justice. A court order prevents us from identifying this woman who used to date Ottawa police officer Eric Post. She reported him to police in 2017, alleging he threatened and physically abused her, but she was told there wasn't enough evidence to charge him. I believe the Ottawa police uh, really protects their own. They really just made excuses for him for so long and it's not right. They failed to serve and protect. A year after her complaint, another woman who met Post on a dating site says he grabbed her throat, slapped and threatened her. He had called me and told me he was going to gouge my eyeballs out and threaten my family. She too complained to Ottawa police, but says they also dismissed her. In frustration, she wrote directly to the chief, imploring him to reopen her case. Only then did police investigate. In 2018, Post was initially charged with 32 offences against seven women, ranging from sexual assault, harassment and pointing a firearm at a victim. 
Last month, the court heard that Post was controlling, childish, and had poor judgment. He pleaded guilty to five charges, assault and uttering threats against the two women we spoke with and two others. But more than two dozen other charges were dropped in the plea deal. The Crown would not say why it brokered a plea deal. Post did not have a previous criminal record. This victim's advocate believes the deal shows police aren't held accountable in the courts in the way others are. We always think about police as people that are there to protect and serve, but if you're on the wrong side of that conversation, it's dangerous. Post will be sentenced in April. His lawyers say he won't comment publicly about the case until then. In the meantime, he remains suspended with pay. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. Canadian restaurants are struggling in the pandemic. But one in Ontario is helping others anyway. There is good people that wants to do good things. And that's the bottom line. Up next, a gesture of thanks for those on the front lines. Such things make you feel inspired that, okay, there's more good to come. Another chief of defense staff is out at issue, digs into the political fallout, plus what these two talked about and what they didn't. This outfit got a teen girl sent home from school in Kamloops, and she has something to say about it. Use your voice. So if you've had an experience like this, speak up. We're back in two. Welcome back. A year of COVID has taught us all about the importance of kindness and of saying thank you to those who work on the very front lines, often exhausted, often afraid, including those in Ontario's hard-hit long-term care homes. As David Common explains, for one business owner, that gratitude is being delivered one meal at a time. These days, it's an unusual sight to see a restaurant hopping, and this one is serving thanks. Nearly 300 meals, all free, destined for the frontline staff of nursing homes. You know, these people are our real heroes, truly, because they go into this long turkey home and they're so close to the virus, they're so close to be at risk, and we needed to send them a message of love. Though Mohamed Faki's Paramount Middle Eastern restaurants are hurting, he's intent on doing well for the staff caring for seniors. I know for a fact that they deserve to be paid better and they need to feel safe. It's hardly Mohamed's first act of goodwill and it won't be his last. His goal now is to deliver 15,000 meals a month for the next three months. And there is good people that wants to do good things. And that's the bottom line. I, I think the solution of the world today with all these problems is having more good people doing good things. That's all. He certainly can't do it alone, getting a lot of help from his staff and donations from his friends. He's also asking for more. You're really ramming them in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hell of a way to fill up a Volvo. <laughs> How are you feeling? Good. Just imagine how the workers feel on the other side, seeing new friends arrive. A small gesture that can go a long way to alleviate the difficulty they face each day. It's not really, it's not easy. It, it's really difficult, like for everybody. This home is in outbreak. Workers facing COVID inside. Hard work, lonely, and sometimes overwhelming. Alyssa Abdul Kadir is one of the nurses here. Sometimes, you know, especially when you're working, when you feel like you have the support, you feel like, yeah, okay, yeah, so you have somebody to carry you. You, you, know, you know, you know, you have somebody to boost you up. Like when you're feeling down, such things make you feel inspired that, okay, there's more good to come. And three more. And good will continue to come. Mohammed wants to not only feed care home workers across Ontario, he wants to inspire others across Canada to do the same. Under masks and shields, there are smiles here. Not so easy under the COVID circumstances. All the more needed because of them. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, a historic photo and a search for answers. The Halifax Museum is looking for help. Do any of these brave volunteers look familiar? 
some relatives have already been spotted. But first, Rosie's back with that issue. Adrian, obviously tonight we're going to talk about the political response to the misconduct investigation into the current chief of the defense staff. I would never turn a blind eye to anything like this. Plus, what was missing from the conversation between the Prime Minister and the President? Chantal, Andrew and Althea will join all of us right after the break. It is deeply troubling that the Canadian Chief of Defence Staff has had to step down only a month after assuming command. There is a problem of leadership which is being shown, shown by this situation. I can assure you and all Canadians that I would never turn a blind eye to anything like this. We will investigate every allegation to making sure there's a fair process in this. We want people to come forward with any allegation and it will be taken seriously. Political reaction today in response to Canada's top military commander, Admiral Art McDonald, stepping aside because of sexual misconduct allegations. This just weeks after we learned the former chief of the defense staff is also being investigated over claims of inappropriate behavior. So what does this tell us about the appointment process, the military, and the potential political damage here? It's Thursday, and I'm here with that issue. Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Um, Andrew, why don't we start with you? The, we learned... Uh, it, it initially came out last night, but we've since learned from uh, our reporting that the allegations come from an incident a decade ago aboard uh, a ship involving a female crew member. Alcohol was involved. How, how big an issue is this? Let's start with, obviously, for the government uh, in terms of accountability. Uh, not necessarily huge. I mean, the, one of the questions that I suppose people will want to know is, who knew about this? How long did anybody in the government know about it? This, with Admiral McDonald, seems to have come more out of the blue, whereas I think there were some questions about uh, General Vance as to whether he was, uh, whether, whether it was something was known about his uh, alleged misconduct. So I think it's the question of who knew what when that is mm -hmm. the most bedeviling. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, it, 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 I'm not sure what lessons can be drawn for the government at this point. Uh, Althea, what do you think in terms of how the government wears this, given that in this case this was their specific choice? Case of Vance, it, it was the pr choice of the previous government. Well, they're not saying anything. So it always <laughs> makes you wonder what it is that they're exactly hiding. And I think what they're unwilling to describe really is the vetting process. So it seems, if you look at the timeline, so Mary Brewster uh, suggests that uh, this this investigation started around the time that the admiral was sworn in, which would be around July, January 14th, but he was announced on December 23rd. So did somebody come forward with allegations after he was announced? Um, you, you don't expect the government to ask every single person that somebody was in, in contact with, you know, did anything happen at this time? If there's nothing in the HR file, if there is nothing that is immediately flagged, if there's no ongoing investigation, you know, there are obviously limits to how far back uh, the government and the PCO would be looking at, at somebody's record. But you do expect them to act and you do expect them to be transparent. And it doesn't seem like they are being transparent and that they're not willing to answer those simple questions about what goes into the vetting process or who knows what when. And it doesn't help the fact that Unfortunately, the defense minister, very nice person, but a terrible communicator. And when you have moments of crisis like this, you want somebody who has earned the trust of people or who can earn the trust of people. And Minister Sajjan is just really unable to communicate clearly. Um, it, it, they, they are saying that they can't answer any of these questions, Chantal, because there is an investigation both into uh, the, the former chief, the, the recent former chief of defense staff and the other one, too. The general questions about the vetting process, they can answer. But uh, I agree that the specifics, uh, no, because fair, a fair process is for both parties. Uh, right. And yeah. on that basis, it's really hard to see how much you can say. Even if you're a great communicator, there are a number of um, facts or unproven facts or whatever that need to be uh, investigated uh, in a court other than that of public opinion, the media, or a parliamentary committee. That being said, I agree with Althea. It's impossible for the government to not act on recommendations 
rather than uh, investigate the entire national defense apparatus and the armed forces from the top down. Sure. I'm not totally surprised. Uh, there has been a culture shift over the past uh, 30 years uh, on issues like this, and people who are appointed to senior positions have gone through the armed forces in a different culture. It's totally possible that skeletons that do not make HR reports mm -hmm. remain in, in some people's closets. Um, okay, let, let's turn to the other uh, sort of big news of the week politically, and that was the, the meeting, obviously, by the president and, and the prime minister, uh, a virtual meeting, obviously not what anyone really wanted. They wanted to be able to hang out together. But uh, let, let me play a clip of, uh, of uh, Joe Biden this week, and we can talk about what it did for the relationship. Let me reiterate our support for the release of the detained Chinese, sorry, the detained in China, to Canadians. Human beings are not bartering chips. You know, we're going to work together until we get their safe return. Obviously, that issue, China, top of mind to, to the government here because they, they believe that the United States can really help uh, to free Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. Uh, uh, Andrew, did, did you... Uh, uh, is the, did enough come out of that meeting in terms of uh, both governments getting what they needed from one another? Or were there things there that, that worried you uh, as potential roadblocks down the road? Uh, not much of either. I mean, I don't think we should invest too much expectations or hopes in a first meeting. Uh, these are mostly for people to get acquainted with each other, to try and get some momentum going, try and get some lock down some agreements on things in, in broad strokes. But you're not going to see major changes uh, in policy or in, in, in agreements between the two countries in any particular sense. So I wouldn't be too despondent that you didn't uh, uh, see that happening. And I wouldn't read too much into the fact that they seem to get along very well. Uh, you would hope after the last four years that they would. Or that things could only get better from where they were. Uh, but the job of the prime minister is not to be the president's pal. Uh, he's to represent the Canadian interests. And if he has to, in subsequent meetings, uh, get in the president's face about things like Buy American or things like uh, sharing vaccines. Um, he's got to be prepared to draw down some of the capital that he might have built up in those initial uh, meetings. So uh, we're, we're not looking for a second bromance, Althea. That's maybe not what Justin Trudeau should be going for here. Well, I don't know. I don't even actually know that there was really a bromance with Barack Obama. I think the same uh, leaders are simpatico in the same way. Trudeau and Biden than Trudeau and Obama. The, the real measure of whether or not your pals will come when you make an ask that is difficult for the other side to do. And they right. decide to do it because they either value the relationship that they've built with you. It's like you change their, their, re, their response in a way that they wouldn't naturally respond. And we haven't seen that yet. Frankly, they avoided some of the pitfalls. I mean, you just aired that clip of um, the president talking about the two Michaels, but uh, Mark Garneau, the foreign affairs minister, was on the current uh, CBC radio's program this week and said that there was actually no specifics discussed. And I'm told that there was no specific ask made from the prime minister to the president on this file. So if you're just talking in terms of vague generalities, and it's great that he mentioned it, but you're not asking him to actually do anything to move this case forward, that to me is not a win. And we saw that they basically avoided the topic of Buy American. You know, you're either avoiding the topic because you know the answer is going to be negative, um, <laughs> or mm -hmm. you're avoiding the topic because you don't need change to happen. And in this case, either it's the vaccines or Buy American. Like Buy American, they briefly talked about it. Basically, the Canadian side will readily admit so yeah. they could put it in their communique. And on the vaccines, they didn't mention it. But 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 is that Chantal to, to Andrew's point the fact that you you can't those first meetings you don't get all that stuff done I mean how much how much should we have expected from that meeting? So this is what normal looks like. It's not exciting. It doesn't produce great headlines, and that is uh, actually to many Canadians more reassuring than the absence of the great headlines. Thank you. Four years of them. I'm not sure I remember very many a public asks where the other side in this relationship gave up something um, in the past. 
certainly not on participating on the war you know, on Iraq, to name those, mm. because when you have an ask and the other side gives up something, you don't make it public. Right. You don't go out and say, look what I won. That would be Donald Trump doing uh, the Canada-U.S. relationship. So they are better aligned. What I hope for is that over the Trump four years, we did kind of fade the focus on the White House re and, and Prime Minister relationship to expand our efforts and build alliances in Congress on Capitol Hill. And I think that that lesson should remain as part of the way we operate. Okay, got to leave it there, everyone, this week. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. If you want to hear a little bit more of, on this conversation, the Canada-U.S. relationship, uh, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content. We're picking up where we left off. Uh, you can find it on any major podcast app. Uh, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. All right, Rosie, so what's going on? What have you got on this Sunday's Rosemary Barton Live? We're going to talk to the head of uh, chief, the chief of immunization for UNICEF uh, in the world, who's very concerned, obviously, about some developed nations hoarding vaccines, like Canada, for instance, buying up as many vaccines as they can, while developing nations uh, continue to struggle. The first delivery from COVAX was delivered to an African nation this week. Uh, so really about vaccine equity. And we're also going to talk to some real Canadians who are waiting and have appointments to get their vaccines next week. Sounds good. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks, Adrian. There has been a shocking increase in anti-Asian racism during the pandemic. But it has prompted some to take action. Up next, what one woman is doing to spread awareness. Plus, the growing support for a teen girl sent home from school for what she was wearing. Well, people have been taking a stand against the surge of anti-Asian racism and the vicious public attacks it spawns. Well, now major fashion and sports apparel brands are amplifying that plea for tolerance. These new social media campaigns offer stark statements of solidarity and support. The marketing machines of global giants aiming this time to stop a trend. Now, a Vancouver woman is also taking up that fight after she faced a racist assault on the street. Katie Nicholson shows us the fear those attacks are generating and we should mention they are hard to watch. Trixie Ling was walking along this path listening to a podcast about anti-Asian racism when it happened to her. He made some sexual gesture and some racial comments about me being Asian, which I ignored. I looked away and that was when he looked um, toward me and he spat on the side of my face. The attack, part of the 717% increase in anti-Asian hate crimes reported to Vancouver police since the start of the pandemic. Like this 92-year-old man thrown to the ground outside a Vancouver store. In the U.S., a new report found more than 2,800 incidents of anti-Asian hate from March to December, and it continues. An 84-year-old died after being viciously tackled in San Francisco. And this 91-year-old in Oakland was shoved to the ground, prompting hundreds to now volunteer to escort elderly Asians when they're out in public. It's not just overt violence. Terry Chu says Asian Canadians are experiencing everything from dirty looks to rude comments. Language matters. The China virus, Kung flu. It's irritating uh, when you see somebody who has a platform that large spewing downright racism. Um, and, and certainly it's not restricted to Trump. I mean, people here are doing it. It's something that hits your gut. And there is fear the new wave of hate won't end when COVID does. Even before the pandemic, people have been subjected to racist, you know, attacks and discrimination at work and also marginalization. So those are not going to go away, regardless whether the virus is around or not. The answer, she says, lies in everyone confronting systemic racism head on. There have been anti-racism campaigns on social media and in school, Trixie Ling is taking it one step further. I think that incident really sparked a flame in me. It was really a catalyst for me to say, this is not okay. She started an anti-racism podcast to stand up not just for Asian Canadians, but for everyone. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, a 21st century rebrand for a kid's classic. 
how Hasbro is making this iconic toy more inclusive. Jamie Poisson and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast Front Burner. With the Golden Globes on Sunday, we take a closer look at the persistent claims that the awards are out of touch and even corrupt. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. A BC teen is speaking out tonight over an incident that's sparking outrage in her community. She was sent home from her high school all because of what she was wearing. It left her feeling hurt and confused, and as Tanya Fletcher explains, many say the incident speaks to an all-too-common double standard. I went to school that morning feeling confident and happy and excited to learn. 17-year-old Karis Wilson recalls getting ready for school Tuesday morning. She wore this knee-length black dress over top of a white turtleneck sweater. 20 minutes into her first class, she was removed and escorted to the principal's office. She says she was told her lingerie-style outfit was making some teachers uncomfortable. At first, I was really confused, and I kind of laughed, and then once I realized she was being serious, my heart just kind of sunk and sunk to my stomach, and I felt, like, alone and awful and sad. She said she was sent home and hasn't been back since. The school district will only say it's concerned about the allegations, is treating them seriously, and that the incident is being reviewed. Her father wound up meeting with school staff and asked to go over the dress code. Unsatisfied with their response, he posted this video on Facebook. Today, I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm hurt, uh, I'm disappointed in, in the system. I'm pretty upset at, at this happening in 2021. The next day, dozens of students staged a walkout at the school in solidarity with Karis. The support, not just local, it's now national too. I uh, received messages from across Canada. Uh, individuals that, because of this video, went to their own school board, their own school, and checked out uh, some of the, the dress codes there. It just highlights that there are there is more work to be done. And this advocate who speaks to teen girls in school says it's something she hears over and over again. They're concerned that there's a double standard in, in terms of dressing between the boys and the girls. And, and I just think that sort of under so belies the underlying issue of um, sexist attitudes and behaviors still existing within our education system. For Karis, she wants to see school dress codes reevaluated, and in the meantime, has this message for other young women. Use your voice. So if you've had an experience like this, speak up. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, coming up, a Second World War era photo and a plea for information about the people in it. I was staring at it and looking at it and I was like, the lady in the white coat looks really familiar. Who one woman spotted in this photo of an all black fire brigade. But first. Mr. Potato Head's been around for nearly 70 years, but now a refresh and a rebrand. <laughs> That's right, the brand and logo are going gender neutral, dropping the mister. They really understand that brands need to be reinvented, reimagined, and kept fresh. Now, to be clear here, the classic characters, Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head, will still exist, but soon so will these new gender neutral versions. The idea? Let kids create whatever kind of family they want to. Limitations not included. Well, this photo was taken nearly 80 years ago and shows members of an all-black fire brigade. Their job, protecting a Halifax neighborhood during the Second World War while firefighters were serving the war effort. Now, the photo wound up at a museum in Halifax, and now the museum is hoping social media can help solve who is in the photo. Their online plea was heard, and what happened next is our moment. The photo came to us in a lot of artifacts. We put it up recently as a tweet. I thought maybe if I could use that hashtag, I could get people to look at it and see if anyone they knew was in that photograph. It was really kind of cool to see this picture pop up and I was staring at it and looking at it and I was like, the lady in the white coat looks really familiar. And I messaged my uncle Wayne Adams and I said, you know, who is this lady? It's your Aunt Pearl. You know, just really excited that we have a picture of my aunt, my great aunt, who actually looks like my mother's older sister, Sandra. It was kind of like this really beautiful surprise. The proudest thing about this picture is looking to see all the women. 
this brigade with women on it. it it's, oh, it's inspiring. I'm hoping more people will start to point out other people in the picture as so being their relative, sharing our history. It's fabulous. <laughs> okay, so they need your help here. Uh, Missy uh, posted her, her discovery on Facebook already. Uh, a friend has said, hey, I recognize somebody else in there. So it's starting. Well, and that's exactly what they're hoping for, right? The museum hoping to, you know, if they can contact enough mm -hmm. relatives and find them all, that maybe they can assemble a reunion of those relatives, maybe even take uh, another iconic photos such as that one. Uh, that's the National for this February 25th. Have a great night. <laughs> Good night.